functions exactly the same. As fast as you depress the trigger is as fast as a round comes out. E320, which some of you probably saw in one of the hearings on the magazine bands, I showed my. Sure, there's a lot happening with the recent Supreme Court order list, especially concerning several cases related to rifle and mag bans, particularly in Illinois. These cases are significant, not just for Illinois, but also for other states like New York, New Jersey, Maryland, California, Oregon, Washington, and more. These states have their own versions of bans on rifles and magazines, making the outcomes of the Illinois cases crucial for how these laws will be treated nationwide going forward. Developments this week. This past week at the Supreme Court, there were several important developments in various cases. One notable case was the Antonyuk case, focusing on New York's Concealed Carry Improvement Act passed shortly after the Supreme Court's Bruin decision. Additionally, there were updates in cases involving bump stocks, particularly the Gitas and Hardin cases. In the Gitas case, the Supreme Court issued a GVR order. This means the court granted the case, vacated the previous decision, and sent it back to the D.C. Circuit Court for re-evaluation. This decision was prompted by the Supreme Court's recent 6-3 ruling in the Cargill case, emphasizing a need for re-evaluation in light of new considerations. On the other hand, the Hardin case, originating from the Sixth Circuit Court, dealt with challenges to the ATF's bump stock ban. In this instance, the Supreme Court opted not to take any action and simply denied review. This decision maintained the Sixth Circuit's ruling, which had favored the pro-Second Amendment side by striking down the bump stock ban. These developments highlight ongoing legal battles over gun laws and regulations, with implications that extend beyond individual states to potentially affect national policy on arm rights and regulations. Notable Developments in Pending Cases Once again, there's been some notable developments in the Supreme Court regarding pending cases. One case that many were anticipating action on was the Sixth Circuit case, potentially for some minor adjustments following the Cargill decision, but the court ultimately chose not to intervene. Moving on, there are several other significant cases that were under consideration during the recent conference, particularly those from Illinois concerning the Protect Illinois Communities Act, which involves the state's rifle and mag ban. For those unfamiliar, these cases include NAGR v. Naperville, Harrell v. Raoul, Barnett v. Raoul, GOA v. Raoul, Langley v. Kelly, and Herrera v. Raoul. They were brought to the Supreme Court seeking early intervention on an interlocutory basis to challenge Illinois' statewide bans. These cases have been scheduled for several reviews and have been relisted approximately five or six times. Once again, this week's order list did not yield any new developments. It's likely they will be relisted for further review at a future conference where the Supreme Court will make decisions on how to proceed with these significant legal challenges. There's a lot of confusion surrounding the status of these cases, especially given their interplay with the Bianchi v. Brown or Bianchi v. Frosch case concerning Maryland's assault weapons ban. Unlike the ongoing Illinois cases, the Bianchi case has already been GVR'd back in 2022 after the Bruin decision. The Fourth Circuit, however, has yet to issue a final decision on Bianchi, despite it being reviewed by a panel. Interestingly, during the recent conference, the Bianchi case was alongside the Illinois cases seeking early intervention. Many expected the Supreme Court to grant review to Bianchi, considering its more advanced stage. However, the court chose earlier to remand Bianchi back to the Fourth Circuit, while keeping the Illinois interlocutory cases hanging. Speculation initially revolved around whether the Rahimi case might influence these issues, potentially prompting action from the Supreme Court. Rahimi's influence falls short. Last week's Rahimi decision, an 8-1 ruling upholding federal restrictions on 2A rights related to domestic violence restraining orders, didn't include any broad language that directly applies to rifle bans or magazine bans. Despite expectations for clarity this week, the Illinois cases challenging these bans have been relisted again. It's likely the Supreme Court is deferring these cases to future cleanup conferences to avoid prolonged consideration throughout the term. These repeated relists might signal the court's intention 
to eventually deny review, possibly with dissenting opinions. This delay could allow justices to prioritize other pending decisions while handling dissenting opinions on the Illinois cases separately. It would depend upon the actual design of the individual item. There were numerous different items being manufactured. ATF estimates that not requiring the $200 stamp from the NFA for a short-barreled rifle. 20 years as a prosecutor, you know the answers to these questions. I'm done asking them. I'm just going to go with 34. Congress pass a law. They didn't. When did the U.S. House pass a rule classifying a pistol brace as a short-barreled rifle? Heller, Common Use Test. The Illinois rifle mag ban cases present an intriguing legal landscape. Recently, the Seventh Circuit panel declined to review these cases, despite using an unconventional Second Amendment analysis that diverged from Heller and the common use test. The Supreme Court's landmark decision in District of Columbia v. Heller established the common use test based on the text and original meaning of the Second Amendment, and under the Supreme Court's traditional role of enforcing national, constitutional baselines against local outliers. The Heller Court established the common use test to decide how a court should determine whether particular objects or arms should be protected by the Second Amendment. Specifically, do the arms being legislated or regulated constitute arms in common use for lawful purposes like self-defense? Yet the Seventh Circuit opted instead for the military use test. Illinois has taken a stringent stance, arguing that popular semi-automatic rifles like AR-15s and AKs are not protected under the Second Amendment because they are deemed dangerous and unusual. What's perplexing is the repeated relisting of these cases by the Supreme Court. Previously, the court has denied emergency reviews and motions for judgments on similar issues, including cases like Bianchi. Even after the Rahimi decision, which didn't have significant implications for these Illinois cases, they continue to be pushed back and forth in the Supreme Court's docket, raising questions about the court's strategy in handling these contentious Second Amendment challenges. One of the key developments to watch closely in the coming weeks is how the Supreme Court handles these Illinois rifle magazine ban cases. While I anticipate the court might simply issue a clean denial with some dissents, I genuinely hope they decide to take up these cases. Addressing these issues could potentially address concerns stemming from the Rahimi decision, which some fear could lead to problematic interpretations by lower courts. Anyone residing in California where similar bans are in place would understand the critical importance of the Supreme Court's stance on these matters. The recent Rahimi decision didn't provide clear answers to these complex issues, and the court's handling of these cases has been quite enigmatic with various relists and decisions. Do these braces, increase the muzzle velocity? The stabilizing Do these allow the, you're not answering any of the questions. Do you think which, you have the authority to reclassify the firearm above because it can be shouldered? Give classifications, and if things don't qualify under the rule, then they don't qualify. How effective? In Illinois, there are significant challenges surrounding the enforcement of arm regulations as highlighted by Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart. According to the data he presented, approximately 114,000 individuals in the state are prohibited from owning guns due to legal issues or mental health concerns. Alarmingly, three-quarters of these individuals have not surrendered their arms as required. Sheriff Dart has appealed to state lawmakers for $10 million in funding to address what he terms as a firearm regulation crisis. This funding would support the training and equipping of more officers tasked with retrieving or securing weapons from those who have had their state firearm owner's identification cards revoked. The goal is to mitigate the risk posed by potentially volatile individuals, preventing incidents of violence like the tragic Henry Pratt Company incident in Aurora. Despite legislative efforts pending in Springfield to increase fees on arms purchases for better enforcement, Time is running short in the current legislative session. Illinois currently has 2.42 million FOID card holders, with revocations occurring when individuals are convicted of felonies, subject to protective orders, or facing mental health issues, among other criteria. Notified gun owners are legally required to surrender their weapons for storage or transfer them to another FOID card holder, but many fail to comply. 
Historically, local law enforcement has relied on repeated notifications to enforce compliance, with limited success. Sheriff Dart's report reveals that a significant majority of revoked FOID card holders, approximately 84,000 out of 114,000, have never accounted for surrendering their arms. The urgency to address these issues was underscored by the tragic events of February 2019, when a former employee of Henry Pratt Company used an arm to commit a mass tragedy despite his FOID card revocation. Similar incidents have tragically occurred, illustrating the dire consequences of non-compliance with armed surrender laws. Sheriff Dart has been proactive in this area since forming a specialized unit in 2013, focusing on handling sensitive situations involving mental health crises. His office has closed thousands of cases, collected numerous FOID cards, and safely transferred weapons to ensure compliance with the law. Legislation enacted in 2021 allocated funds for revocation enforcement teams, but challenges persist, with a backlog of cases remaining unresolved. Efforts by the Illinois State Police to enforce revocations have shown some progress, but the scale of the issue requires more robust measures. In the state legislature, Representative Bob Morgan has proposed increasing fees on armed transfers to bolster enforcement efforts, citing the need for stronger measures to retrieve arms from individuals with revoked FOID cards. The proposal aims to allocate additional resources to the Illinois State Police's Enforcement Fund, reflecting a broader effort to address the proliferation of arms among non-compliant individuals. As these efforts continue, Sheriff Dart and supporters of stricter arm regulation emphasize the critical need for comprehensive measures to reduce the risk of arms falling into the wrong hands and to prevent further tragedies in Illinois communities. Stay tuned as we continue to monitor these developments closely. Subscribe to stay updated as we unravel the latest updates from the Supreme Court in the weeks ahead.